and welcome to this episode of Selling Through Partnering Skills, where I am joined by Danny Levy from Singapore. Danny, hi. Hey, Fred. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it's afternoon yeah. for you, though, isn't it? It is afternoon for me, although you were very kind. You did it at 7 a.m. your time. So it's 3 p.m. here, so I'm still fresh. Yeah. Oh, but no normally, when I speak to the UK, it's kind of past 6 o'clock, and I'm, you know, energy levels are already dipping. I, I'm normally a bit fresher in the morning, but I, I suppose people can can listen and judge whether there's, a, there's any discernible difference between the way I uh, yeah. the way I act. But no, look, I, I appreciate you um, getting in touch. So could you just do the, the very brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, sure. So, so my name is Danny Levy. I'm the managing director of a company called Worldwide Business Insights, and I've been living in Singapore now. This is my 11th year. I'm from the UK originally. I, I, I was born in Yorkshire lived in London for about seven years and then relocated with my wife uh, to Singapore in 2010. We thought we'd be here for a couple of years uh, and here we are 11 years later. We've got two children now uh, and just uh, we're fortunate enough to buy our first property here in Singapore last year. Oh, brilliant. So plans to, to stay there for the foreseeable, yeah? I, I would say so, yeah. The girls are very settled in school and uh, the wife's quite happy. So she has a big say in things, as you can imagine. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, and I mean, the reason I wanted to talk to you is you have a you have a, a rich background in sales and, and, and quite an, an interesting story, which hopefully you can tell us pretty quickly, because yeah. part of the whole point is that you you got promoted pretty quickly. I did. Yeah, I did. I mean, the kind, the kind of classic story of, of, I guess, falling into sales, as most people do. I, um, I majored in um, history uh, in, in university in London. And um, I went into work uh, just before the financial crash, 2008, and uh, lost my job, as a lot of people did back then, because I was working in kind of financial markets and, and PR. And I was really kind of scratching my head and, and looking for my, my first role. And my first role was more in kind of a research uh, and production type position uh, for a company in London, uh, although I had a lot of exposure to sales. Uh, so I was, you know... I guess, I guess I came in through a strange route in that I was more like a subject matter expert, domain expert, and I would work a lot with the sales team, but I, I always felt like, oh no, I don't want to do sales. You know, sales, sales isn't something that I should get involved in. Um, although I, you know, I really enjoyed the research and I really enjoyed talking to customers and, and writing the reports. Um, and when I moved out to Singapore, uh, as you can imagine, I, I got offered the opportunity to to come out to Singapore in 2010 as a as a general manager, and I was uh, I was 25 years old, um, so it was a huge opportunity for me, and I, I relocated. And I think when you when you come out and when you start your own business, um, you've really got no choice but to sell, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, then it's all on your own shoulders, and and you've often you've got the the kind of headaches that go around with with starting a company and. Nobody knows you, nobody knows who you are, and you, you've got to kind of build that reputation. But we also had no team when we came over. So uh, not only was I um, still doing the research, the production, putting the products together, I was also having to sell to the clients. Um, but I found that because of the background I had, I did have a, quite a deep understanding of the different markets we were operating in. And that, that always helped me in sales because, and we'll get into it, I guess, when we go through the points, but you know, one of the ways that you can really build trust um, with your potential customers is, is that you know what you're talking about. If you, if you really know what you're talking about and you can have a, a very kind of sensible back and forth with them and ask the right questions, um, you're going to build trust a lot quicker. And I, and I was fortunate enough to have that. And I had some great successes. I had some good wins. And then all of a sudden, I, I kind of got the belief that, oh, maybe this is something I should, should be doing. And, and I've always enjoyed talking to people and meeting people and networking. And then kind of from there, I, I then went off to set up my, my own company in 2011. And again, did a lot of sales because I had to make a success out of that. And then I joined Worldwide Business Research in um, 2013 and I had a hybrid role. So again, it was uh, a head of a department, but also a selling role. So I was in the trenches selling. Uh, and again, I was doing all the research or the product development for about three months. And then I would come on to the sales cycle. So then I would have all the sales cycle that, and, and the kind of, we call it pre-brochure targets and post-brochure targets. And again, it had some great success. I think I sold the two biggest individual deals in the history of the Asian office out here to some large companies. Um, 
and then was fortunate enough to to become general manager for that business in 2015 and then managing director more recently uh, and now I manage all the different departments across sales production marketing operations uh, inside sales which is here and in the Philippines uh, and customer experience so very varied background but but yes a lot of it's been in sales yeah no I mean a, a great pedigree we've got that international element and I know you think about sales a lot I've heard you speak on various podcasts which is why I thought you know what yeah I, I want Danny on this because I want to sort of take you very specifically or take us through very specifically the elements of PQ and you've already started mm -hmm. look at you ahead of me I guess this is why you're so successful <laughs> you, you're anticipating stuff um and, and we'll go through the elements and I mean I I tend to start with trust and it's what you naturally gravitated to when you were talking yeah. there so yeah let's have a think about you know whether it's what you've done it's how you advise salespeople. it's just mm. what can we you know sales community sales people do to get better at this trust element because it's so important yeah i had to think about this in advance i think i didn't want to talk through too many points because there's lots of different <laughs> ways that you can build trust um both you know during the sales process after the sales process when it comes to to re-signing customers but the two most important things for me I think you need to think through and I, I talk to my team about this as well and have lots of conversations uh, with them is how are you providing value I think I touched on it a bit there but um, buyers now are, are more educated than ever um, you can read up normally about all the features and benefits and watch videos uh, read testimonials and see social proof um, all online, looking at websites uh, and looking at uh, product reviews um, before you would ever need to speak to a salesperson. So I think if you put yourself in your customer shoes, and we're all buyers ourselves as well, um, is that when you actually have to go through the pain of talking to a physical person, because nowadays no, most people don't <laughs> actually want to be sold to, they don't want to talk to anyone. If they could automate the process, I'm sure they would. So why would they talk to someone? They would talk to someone to add value uh, to them and, and they want someone that that's an expert that's someone that can listen to them and, and guide them and maybe solve problems that they might not know they even have um you know really uh, sales is often more understanding people uh, people and psychology first i think if you can do that um and really mirror your um your prospects uh, emotions and and movements and you know, just, just get them on the side and, and you've got to be that kind of that ear that they, they, they'll open up to and they'll talk to. Um, but when it comes to time, you know, you're able to kind of step in and offer that really tailored, really bespoke uh, solution that, that, will, that will solve their pain points. And often, as I said before, you know, that's, that's a problem they might not be aware of. And the second thing, I, I think, just following on from that is, are you going to do what you say you're going to do? So, in my career, I've seen lots of times where people, unfortunately, will overpromise to get the deal done, um, which I think is really counterproductive because if you can't deliver on your promise, uh, then the trust will be broken immediately. Uh, and this is a shame because customers, if they're happy, you do what you say you're going to do, they have a really high ROI on their investment, they're going to come back and, and spend more with you. So you should always set expectations from the get-go. Don't be afraid to say, you know, sorry, we can't do something if you really can't do it. And again, <laughs> there's another point, it's kind of a bonus point, but if you can't do something, tell them. And if you have weak areas or if you're not strong in a certain play, tell them because we're not perfect at everything as, a, as companies and as people. And again, by kind of uh, addressing all of your maybe not strong points up front, uh, you're kind of addressing the objections up front. And again, this goes a very long way to building, to building trust. So I think they're the kind of, two to three things that you should be doing, you know, providing tons and tons of value. That's what people are looking for. Do what you say you're going to do and, prom and and execute on that so they come back. And then finally, don't be afraid to, to tell people if you can't do something or if you're not strong in a certain area. Again, that's going to build trust because you're being honest. So that'd be kind of like the main things I would always encourage people to do. I love those. And I love the way that you said you're going to do two, gave us three. Yeah. So you built value By while mistake. you're talking about building value. Oh, I yeah. like, no, look, I'll, I'll edit that out so people think yeah. you did that on purpose. Talked about value by adding value. Oh, yeah. masterstroke. No, and there's something else you said really interesting there, which we hear a lot. You know, because there's lots of information online and features and benefits mm. and blah, blah. 
but he said there's all social proof online so actually mm. me sitting here and telling me how great we are and all these people we've worked with and done it you're a buyer going i know that's yeah. why i'm talking to you <laughs> i've done the research i'm not daft it's my job so yeah. we can save ourselves time on that and then get into the that more human side if you like of connecting with the person and really understanding okay so you know we can do all this let's think about how we do that for you precisely yeah so you, you don't you, you probably need to spend two to three minutes actually just reaffirming your value proposition and your story and then really it's about talking about them making it all about them and just making sure that you're asking the right questions and not going through a checklist too many people just go through a checklist or they're they're trying to tick off a formula a sales formula that they've been taught so they can identify if they're a decision maker and they've got some money again you have to enjoy actually the process you have to enjoy talking to people and, and uncovering all these various pain points and and opportunities and and being super interested in their journey uh, that might not need, lead to a sale at the end of it but you know you might be able to refer them to somebody else or help them down the road uh, but that's what it's all about you've got to go in with a really open mind uh, and that will build loads of trust yes yeah, i was just smiling because i thought you got you got to spend two or three minutes just re-establishing your value prop <laughs> to remind them what meeting they're in yeah that's it yeah. <laughs> because the diary's like a patchwork quilt so it's this oh yeah yeah i remember why i'm meeting you now yeah, that's yeah, cool yeah. good right let's open up yeah. um so it's not people, even pe to... people don't want to sit through one of those horrible SaaS demos which is like a hundred slides yeah. and then they go any questions <laughs> yeah and, walk out and everyone I, goes, I forgot why i'm talking about this yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. what are you talking about and then they're all high-fiving each other as they walk out, you know, thinking that they're going to be talking about that product solution all day, that, yeah, that pitch the, all day, yeah. And the buyer's, like, getting really excited why because yeah, yeah. they're allowed out. Yeah. <laughs> it's like school's That's out, it. yay. But, but again, interesting when you said, you know, it's a pain to talk to people. Yeah, sometimes it is. And if you can be good at it, that be, you know, mm. that differentiates you. I mean, I've chatted yeah. to a couple of people who said, no, actually, that can be a differentiator. Mm. So a lot of things you're selling will be the same. But yeah. If it's good to talk to you you're not only just a decent person i'm not just that oh good old boy thing but the way you ask questions you make me think you help me mm -hmm. uh, we get we get closer to you understanding what i'm trying to achieve and of course i'm trying to achieve something i'm a salesperson which, which that kind of moves into this win-win focus thing and so we're kind of naturally drifting in what, what are your thoughts on that how can we how can we keep ourselves really thinking yeah. about both parties yeah I'd say just before we jump into win win, what, one last thing on trust as well is like th there's been a lot of people I've worked with through my career where I've built a lot of trust, I've delivered for them, and then maybe they've changed companies and they continue to spend with you. Mm. Um, or or you've you built a load of trust and they're with a company and it's just not the right time, but you, you build so much trust that you have a relationship then and you meet outside of work. And again, they move companies and they then work with you. Or the company they're with, they're not working with you, but they're referring you into other potential clients and customers. So again, it's all around that kind of not having that short-term mindset and, and really looking more strategically, uh, which I think takes us nicely into kind of win-win orientation. Um, Go for it. You're on a flow, yeah, yeah. mate. Carry yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say with the with the win-win stuff, I, I would say when, when, when you want to make it win-win, everyone wants to feel like they've walked away with the best deal on the table. Um, so if you, again, if you think about you as a consumer, uh, you never want to buy something only to find out you could have got a better deal somewhere else. Um, this definitely applies to B2B sales. So, so everyone wants to feel like they've got the best deal. People, if you're, you know, if you're talking to say marketing, they want to feel like, you know, they can look good in front of their boss um, and they've done a really good job. So as, as I was saying in the earlier point, and again, I keep touching on it, but it's about not having that short-term mindset. If you're, if you're building trust, you, you've got to build these long-term relationships. So I think you've got to, you've got to get your customer wins. Uh, and if they, if they get deals or if they get a very high ROI from, from what you've been able to do for them, uh, they're going to come back to you. It's win-win for them. So I think Drop the short-term mindset, and I think you've got to start thinking about long-term strategic relationships. And when your customers win, you win. That's the whole thing. So that that for me is the win-win orientation. Um, and and it also goes back to kind of that reciprocal. I'm, I'm getting the pronunciation wrong. That you do something for me, I do something for you. But it's all around like you know, 
how can I help you? It's not always around, well, I'm going to call you when I want something. Uh, I'm going to call you because I want you to do business with me. So if they're an existing customer, you know, make sure you're getting in touch with them regularly just to check in. Maybe you're going to go and meet them for a beer. Um, some, it's their birthday. You send them a card. You know, you, you keep the relationship going. You always want to feel like it goes both ways. And then these are the people like I just touched on that will spend with you. They'll change companies. They'll make spend with you. They'll refer you. And that's a win-win relationship as well. It's all about this kind of long-term thinking uh, that really is the win-win for me. Brilliant. Yeah. Do you like the way I did help you out with the word? Yeah, it was good. You can see. Because that, that, that would be two of us. That would be two of us. No, no, no. no but, but brilliant points. Brilliant points. And I mean, the, oh, we've cut open a whole kind of worms here, but that, that longer-term mindset, Yeah. do you think that sales management sometimes don't help that? <laughs> bit of a loaded question there. yeah yeah <laughs> it, it's definitely true i mean if you've got to hit your your sales targets and you've got to hit your numbers then obviously short-term thinking will come into play uh, especially when you're if you're newer if you're just into the business then you know you might not be able to look beyond one month two months three months um again i think that's got to come from above though um your sales management have to kind of instill this in you from the get-go um, and it has to be a safe environment so if they're talking to a customer again and and the manager should should be letting them know you know it's counterproductive if you're going in and you're just trying to fit them into a, a round hole and they're a square peg um, if it's not going to fit so if they're not ready to buy you know you've got to kind of suggest what they can do where they can go who they could work with uh, and just make sure that you're adding value and, and staying in touch because for what every one person that isn't ready to buy, there'll be another person that is ready to buy. And it's all about, you know, balancing the two, I think, if you're the manager and, and making sure that your team understand that. I think managers have got, or management have got a massive responsibility on this. I've come across some mm. really confused salespeople. I mean, to the point where I've done training, and that's me to training, talked about relationship building, we talked about business outcomes, you know, all that good stuff, stuff you're saying. Mm. two days third day right call outs given a short-term target i mean literally a day target which undermined everything we've just been doing is right okay i'm not gonna go on anything i get quite annoyed <laughs> about that just thinking about it but no it, it, it's an important an important part and i'll get uh, interrupting your flow because you're on one so the the win-win <laughs> focus again for me yeah. it wraps up with the interdependence element doesn't it you know, mm. in, uh, not you know, salespeople can be quite independent. Yeah. So again, I am. I'm loving your thoughts so far. What are your thoughts on interdependence and how we can become more comfortable with that as salespeople? And when you say interdependence, you mean in terms of being able to work on your own as part of a group? Is that what you're getting at? I I mean it in the widest possible sense. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I just wanted to no, clarify. I'm, well, no, because it's interesting how people answer it. Yeah. Um And. The answer you give, I'll kind of not give the opposite, okay. but I'll give other versions of it, if you like. So Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, f for me, um, I'm always looking for very driven individuals with a, with a can-do mindset. I think I always believe you need people that are very good at looking at what they can control, what's in their kind of sphere of influence. And as part of this, you have to be able to work independently uh, and as part of a team. I think at the moment it's very under the microscope because our teams are working remotely. Uh, so you need people to really be able to do what they're accountable for whilst working from home. Um, it's much less easy now, you know, I think before a lot of the sales methodologies and trainings and the way people manage was all about having your sales team in the office and being able to see what they could, they were doing at all times. And there was this, there's a huge focus on you know, power hours and call times. And obviously all of that's now been pushed apart as people have moved into the work from home environment. So I think being able to work independently uh, and, and really do what you're accountable for and still be able to show results and stay positive because it's, it's a pretty challenging time right now. Um, I think that's more important than ever. And I think it's important to highlight that in sales that Preferring to work alone, though, or more in a team dynamic doesn't necessarily re affect results. I've always seen that. So I, I know many high performers that prefer to work alone 
and many high performers who prefer the team dynamics. So I would say if you're listening to this and you're more of a lone wolf, I wouldn't feel bad or get too down about it because there's nothing wrong with that. You can still go on to have a, a massively successful say, career in sales if you prefer to work alone, uh, are organized, can manage your data, build rapport with clients and customers. You can still smash your, your monthly sales targets, annual sales targets. Um, however, I would say that if you want to move into to management one day or if you're already in management and, and you don't enjoy working in a team, then, then I would maybe take a look in the mirror and reevaluate where you want to go because um, a huge part of management is having to get the best out of people. And, and like we touched on earlier, I think about building trust uh, with customers, a lot of that is just listening to what they have to say. And management's exactly the same. It's, it's listening to your internal customers, your internal your team, uh, and being able to empathize with them and understand where they're coming from give advice, give training to help them overcome anything or improve them. And again, you've still got to have that independence. You still have to be a high performer, I think, when you step into management, because I would say that where I do see some people go wrong in management is that they feel like they can just step into management and they're now in an ivory tower and, you know, they never have to get involved really in the trenches again or or do any of the dirty work or go to, to, go to client meetings or listen to client calls or anything like that. You've still got to be that player coach. So I say, I think you still got to stay very relevant. Um, you should still listen to customer calls, go to client meetings, do sales calls yourself if you can every now and again, just to stay fresh. And also that feedback from, from customers is invaluable. I think when you're a manager, just to keep yourself ticking over and make sure that you are actually pushing the business in the right direction. Because I think if you're not talking to your customers, then uh, sometimes you can be quite surprised about what they tell you. So I, to answer your question, interdependence for me is, being very driven, being able to get on with your own work, being 100% accountable for what you need to do, um, but also having that mindset of, you know, I, I still need to be able to empathize with my team, get on with my team, get the best out of people uh, and support them where needed. And, and as you rise up the ranks, that becomes more important. Yeah, no. Yeah. And you could, you could arguably, if, you're, if you take the mindset that in some ways the customer is part of my team as well, and yeah. I have to give elements of control to them. I can't do it for yep. myself, you know, that, that makes sense. But now I noticed we're both, if, if people are listening, they won't have seen us like if you're watching it on uh, on YouTube, say, but uh, we're both kind of smiling when it's like the whole, if you're in management, it helps if you like people type yes. thing. <laughs> because I suspect if you're like me, you've probably had a couple of people flash into your mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do you want to do this job? You just don't yeah. like humans. You're not yes. right. Yeah, yeah. We'll, to be no. to be good to be really be good in management, you don't have to like people. You have to love people, yeah. right? You you have to have a, a real passion for for people. And if you don't have that passion, then unfortunately, it's your people that will suffer. You mean we can't use spreadsheets? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I know there's probably people in your mind. Let's move on. No names, yeah. no pipe drill. Um, <laughs> um, no. So so again, you've actually touched on this already when you were talking about. Um, about when you said to customers and, and part of the trust building part, which is being honest and saying things like, you know what, I can't do that, being open and honest. And mm. for me, that that does make up this this element or part of this element of self-disclosure and feedback. Yeah. So, you know, you start touching on it. Well, what other thoughts have you got around that? I think self-disclosure and feedback, I mean, again, this goes both ways, right? It goes internally and it goes externally when you're dealing with, with clients and partners. Um, for me internally, I always try and give open and honest and very constructive feedback as regularly as possible. Um, I don't wait until the kind of quarterly annual reviews, uh, sorry, the quarterly reviews or the annual reviews just to give people a load of feedback or kind of development points. I think that's a big mistake uh, if people do that because if you, if you do do that, you're keeping people in the dark massively on, on how they're doing. They probably think that they're flying along and there's no issues. Uh, and then all of a sudden they've got this big shock and that can be taken very badly. Um, or, or they can then kind of maybe mistrust you because they think, oh, well, why was this person hiding, hiding all this from me for so long? They kept telling me everything was great. So I think you've always got to have very clear communication as it kind of gets everyone on the same page, pulling in the same direction. Uh, and... And it goes both ways. I think for me, I always want my team 
to tell me how I'm doing. I always ask them to tell me how I'm doing. Um, I want to know if I'm executing as well uh, as I could be doing, if the company's doing as well as we could be doing, um, or, or if there's just things that we're not doing. So again, because I'm not speaking to customers every day for those, for those people in customer facing roles, I also really want to get that customer feedback. I'm always really keen to, to get the sales calls and just to sit and listen to the sales calls so I can hear the customer feedback directly. But I also want that feedback from the sales teams, from the research teams, the production teams, the marketing teams, because I also want to know what they're hearing and how I can help them. And, and then similarly, the last point uh, internally is that if you bring someone into your business that maybe has come from a different industry, I always want to get their perspective on things because I think that feedback from someone that maybe has a slightly different lens on things that doesn't have that kind of tunnel vision, uh, you know, and again, um, sometimes we get into the habit of, well, we did it like that last year, so we should do it like that this year. And you know, someone else comes in and they've got that different mindset or they can just look at things in a slightly different way. I think getting that feedback from them um, on how we're doing or if we're, if we're doing the right things in, in certain departments. So again, maybe they've come into marketing uh, and they've marketed for B2C instead of B2B. Um, they would have a, a much different viewpoint on maybe how we're, how we're doing our advertising or how, what we're doing for our social media strategy. And I'd like to know what they think or what they were doing previously to help us maybe optimize and try new things. So I think that's invaluable. And then kind of reverse mentoring. So maybe there's someone in your business that's younger than you, or again, has that different industry experience that maybe you just like to get feedback from or, or some mentoring from in this area. And again, it's all around kind of removing your ego and being open to getting to getting that feedback. And I think, again, most of these points also mirror when we're dealing with customers and clients. So again, um, just, just being open and honest, and especially through the health pandemic, um, if you weren't open and honest and, and direct and, and clear with customers around why things were happening as they were, why the business was moving maybe in a slightly different direction, what we were doing, getting everybody on the same page, um, you know, over communicating, I think then probably customers felt in the dark, they felt lost. And, and they may not have stayed with you. So, so that they would really be my thoughts there. Uh, great, great thoughts. Reverse mentoring, I love that. Yeah. And, 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 that and that idea that I know some salespeople, when you're listening to the call, they get very self-conscious mm. and everything. It's like, no, oh, hang on a minute, why am I doing it? I'm doing it to help you get better. Yeah. I've got better interest. If I thought you were that bad, I wouldn't be letting you make the call anyway. Let's just take that for written. And actually, I'm not really listening to you, to be honest. <laughs> I'm listening to the customer. I want yep. to know this stuff. Yep. And then I'm going to ask your opinion on the stuff I've heard because it just makes us all better. It's insights, isn't it? Which is what, what we should as salespeople be, be, be trading in. So That's it. But it's quite um, funny. Whenever you ask a salesperson for a tape, they just go, huh? why? why? A tape? I just need one tape this week. Oh, my recorder broke. The system's down. I can't log in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've not done any calls. Yeah. I prefer yeah, to yeah. tell you I've not done any calls than you to yeah, listen yeah, yeah. to. I'm not even listening to you. So if yeah. I had doubts, you wouldn't be doing it. No, that's yeah. that's cool. You just and, got to communicate clearly, re yeah. remove the tension, then you get it. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, that, that's why yeah. I'm doing it. You know. So yeah. no, I love it. I love that. And mm. again, you know, we're, we're stepping into the next section, which is this comfort with change. You know, and obviously we've all yeah. had to be whether comfortable is the right word but we've gone through massive change yeah. but we would be doing anyway to a degree and i think as sales people yeah. we're selling change aren't we so again you know mm. all, all these are episodes on their own really aren't they but um thoughts on thoughts on change and comfort with change and, and sales people sales managers as well role in that yeah i think change is never easy um I mean, it, this, this applies to sales, but outside of sales as well, I think just to us as people, I think um, we all like our routines. It brings a real sense of comfort and security. If I think back to my kind of previous couple of years commuting into the middle of town here in Singapore, I got on the same train car every day, kind of <laughs> held onto the same rail. Um, I walked the same way to work, even though there were about five different routes I could take. I went to the same coffee shop. I went to the gym at lunch at the same time, did the same workouts. <laughs> you just get into that kind of routine and without even thinking about it, it's just, it just brings you that kind of comfort and that safety net. Um, 
and no one likes change. No one really goes, I mean, some people do, but no one really actively goes out and, and thinks, what can I do differently this week, this month, uh, this year to really drive myself forward? Um, and, and the health pandemic's obviously been terrible, but I think one of the positive things that's come out, out of it is that it has kind of forced everyone to really rethink um, how they were doing things before. We've, we've had to rethink it. I mean, for us, we have a 100% digital business model now here in Asia, which if you told me that 12 months ago, I probably would have thought you were crazy that, that we'd have that. But it, it, it has forced us to kind of make these big, bold changes. Uh, and again, like you mentioned, I think it, it links closely into that last point, this one around change, because you've got to be comfortable uh, communicating. You've got to communicate the change to people. And again, this goes back to internally and externally with customers that I just touched on. I think it's change is much less scary when you're kind of open and honest about what's going on with your team and with your customers. And, and the funny thing is we as people, the minute someone says, oh, well, um, we're going to do this, we're going to launch this new business line, this new channel, whatever it is, and maybe we're going to launch a podcast and um, we've never done it before and we want to get X, Y, and Z results in six months immediately everyone just panics and thinks, oh, how's this going to affect me personally? You know, oh, what does that mean for my current role? Am I going to lose my job? So I think that for some reason, whenever you say change, people just become really panicked and worried that it's going to affect them in the worst possible way. So I think if you can kind of bring them into the reasons around why things are changing, what the change will look like, what the implications are for them personally, I think that's a big thing. What are the implications for you personally? Um, because again, internally, people are worried externally customers probably think, oh, well, the change just suits you. You know, the, you're changing because you need to change. We don't want the change, um, with customers, a big thing for me last year was, was really reinforcing as we moved into this new environment that we were still the same company, you know, everything you love about the company, all the benefits of working with us, um, everything we did before was still there. It was just that we were doing it in a digital channel and they were still going to get that experience. And then you could see the relief, the weight lifting of some of the clients and customers shoulders when you kind of taught them through that. And you just reminded them, look, we've delivered for you for five years. You know, um, that's not going to stop. We're still going to deliver on our promises and give you the best possible ROI that we can. And then people relax. So it's, it's all around, I think, removing that personal fear of the unknown and then <laughs> And we always do this as people, don't we? But the the, the, the kind of noises in our head, um, once you've kind of verbalized that, and then actually once you've actually gone through the process, once you've delivered the podcast or you've uh, done the online virtual summit or put together um, the digital campaign, you think, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't so bad. That was pretty good. And actually now we've got this great new business line. And why didn't we do that before? So, you know, you shouldn't fear change, I think, you should embrace it and you should always be trying to, to do something new in your, in your professional and personal life, because it's the only way that you'll really be able to kind of push yourself to greater heights. Yeah. It, it's funny though, isn't it? That when we, when we talk change, like you've just given examples there, people mm. think you're taking something away. Yeah. And the example again, so we're going to introduce a podcast. Oh no, I'm going to lose my job. No, it means we've got more work to do. Yeah. <laughs> you have to work extra actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, we're going to add a new CRM. Oh, no, then you'll have more data. You'll be able to get stuff out of it easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find things for you automatically that you can then use. People just, oh, you're taking away. No, we're giving. Yeah, yeah. You know? I don't know why it's strange, right? People just kind of default into that threat, threat alarm. Yeah, what threat, does it mean? God. Yeah. There'll be sort of part of the deep brain and everything, but it's this, this that yeah. something is going. No, we're adding. You know, like, again, yeah. look at my own, own product, you know, the training. Oh, you're taking, taking the classroom away. Yeah, but we've added, mm. well, we're not because the classroom is just digital, but we've added this and this and this and this. Yeah. You know, it's like, there's more, it's more rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had to, so. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, and then on the provider side, though, I think it's funny, though, like, if you look at a platform like we're using now, like Zoom, I think one of the reasons they've been so successful is because it, it was brand new for everyone a year ago, but Zoom was the platform that was the most simple to use. This episode isn't sponsored by Zoom. Um, it was the most simple to use. It's just one click, you're in, you can see someone. Again, it was change, but it was change that was simple and easy to use. Whereas you see some of the other maybe video conferencing call systems or web, web call systems, um, summit systems that were, were clunky, were difficult to use. And then they're making the change more difficult. They're the ones that lose out. 
So don't make the change more difficult, simplify the change and make it as low lift and as easy as possible for people. That also really helps people kind of embrace it. I like simplify the change. We, we, we always yeah. say embrace the change, don't we? It's just like it's a simplify, simplify, oh, yeah. change. Oh, embrace yeah. it. Simplify yeah. the change. Ah, yeah. right. We can sort of yeah. get into that. That's how you embrace it, if you like. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Make it as easy as possible. Yeah. Um, which is through the communication, as you said. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and a lot of this, again, you know, we kind of naturally flow into this sort of the last element of PQ, which is future orientation, which, again, we're kind of speaking about already yeah. so yeah again, let's just underline that and any particular thoughts about about having that and why we we need that as a salesperson or sales yeah. manager you talk about both which is which is really cool yeah i think i think two points again here for me i would say uh, the easiest way to position yourself for the future and again we've touched on it quite a bit is to speak to your customers um i think you've got to talk to them regularly just to figure out how they're interacting with your product with your solution um what do they like? Don't they like? What could be better? Uh, how can we optimize? And you've got to you've got to listen and use and act on that feedback. Uh, I think, especially now through the health pandemic, um, companies have had to uh, we had to use this word word once pivot um, multiple times. People have had to kind of do multiple course corrections um, because people have been optimizing, going into new digital business models. Maybe they're selling online for the first time, doing e-commerce. Uh, doing online training, presenting, whatever it is. And I think getting that customer feedback will, will really help you do that. I think nobody's a savant, nobody, unless you're like, you know, super gifted multi-billionaire business owner, um, nobody really understands what their customers want. You've got to speak to them to get that information and to be able to, to do a course correction or, or just rethink things and going a new direction. And that will help you future orientate yourself and, and future proof the business. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that, and again, we've touched on this a bit, is, is you've just got to create a really safe culture internally um, where people feel like they can suggest new ideas, new innovations, um, and they can try new things and that there's going to be no judgment. So maybe you have something like an ideas hour once a week where people drop ideas into a box and everyone reads them out and you discuss them um do some brainstorming uh, you can have a group that goes off and test that idea and see if it would work in a controlled environment um unfortunately i think a lot of companies are very resistant to trying new things or people feel like oh, i'm not going to suggest anything because no one's going to listen to me um failure has a stigma attached to it i think people are worried like oh if i try something and i fail uh, people will look at me badly internally and that's that's going to reflect really badly on me so i'm not going to try anything but I think the stigma is only true if you kind of fail and, and don't get back up. So I think as leaders, as, as managers, if you're listening to this, I think you've got to create a culture where people are really empowered to take a risk. And if they fail, that's okay. Actually, it's worse if you don't try uh, and, and then you won't fail. But if you don't try, it's even worse. Uh, so I think as long as you learn from it, get back up quickly and keep moving forward, you can drive the business force and you, you'll be able to kind of future orientate your business. Um, and often you have to fail a few times before you get it right. So if you're not kind of constantly testing, learning, optimizing, speaking to customers uh, and trying new things in new areas alongside your maybe more kind of existing business models, I think as the last year's definitely shown us, then you're going to be in for a bit of a shock. Yeah, I'm just going to paraphrase that because we, we, we could be all facetious. You know, so, oh, yeah, yeah you got this guy on the podcast and he said, speak to customers. So, oh, wow, yeah, what an insight. But, yeah. No, but what you were saying is, right, we can talk about the customers day in, day out about what we're doing here and now. Great, that's yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. But almost separate a conversation, say, hey, guys, let's let's future scope. Let's have a separate session. Let's do something. Let's look ahead. Let's be a bit fanciful, blue sky, whatever language you want. Mm. And really, let's go a bit crazy on this and, and look because we can't, we haven't got the crystal ball, but let's do best we can. And yeah. I think that's what you're saying. It's be very deliberate. And this is a, you know, kind of no holds barred. We're just going to talk about future and let's see what, let's see what comes of it. Yeah. Very healthy conversation to have. Yeah. I think it's talking about the future um, internally and, and, and brainstorming and trying new things. But I think also every time that you do a project for a customer or you deliver it for a customer or they're happy or they're not happy, you are talking to them and you're understanding why. Yeah. Because again, that, that feedback, whether it's from, you know, talking to customers directly, doing a focus group or uh, doing a survey, um, 
it, if you're not getting that feedback, you, you might go in the wrong direction or you might just do things that, that don't improve the business. So I think that feedback is this, this kind of main source of truth. Love it. Love it. Now, there's some great stuff you've been, you've been sharing uh, here with us, Danny. So while we're on the future then, what's your future? <laughs> what's <laughs> next for you? You know, what, 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 what can you share this <laughs> about your business, about your podcast, about, yeah, yeah. yeah what's uh so yeah, I mean, uh, the business looks, looks quite different. I mean, um, so worldwide business research, you know, before we were, we still are the, the market leading B2B, uh, large scale events organizer in the world. Uh, our U USP unique selling point has always been around the amount of time that we invest in the research and the program development. Uh, and since the health pandemic has hit, then um, we've shifted all of those large scale events online. Um, we, we use an online platform that's, that's, that's great now. We, we've just optimized that. So we're really excited about the big online LSEs this year. We think our customers will, will get all of the same kind of uh, benefits that they used to get through all the different learning formats uh, through that. And then we have a really thriving one-to-one -one meeting model. So we will profile attendees, we'll understand uh, decision-making, how much budget they have, immediacy, across all the big uh, verticals that were strong in things like e-commerce, things like uh, digital marketing, uh, customer experience. Uh, and then we will help our, our, our sponsors, our, our clients, uh, we'll match make them up with, with the right customers that are looking to spend in investment categories that are relevant for them in the short time frame. And they'll have all the meetings online and through a digital platform. Uh, and then there'll be a one day very high level of, of content and learning interactivity that's all fully private uh, invite only uh, and then we also got a, a thriving now um, kind of content syndication uh, market research business out here in asia so we do kind of bespoke reports for customers across certain uh, geographies and markets around different areas uh, and um, yeah my, my podcast all ties into that as well it's another channel that that customers can can make the most out of i i get clients on the podcast and we we um, repurpose all of that content across our newsletters uh, across our emails, our, our, our event portals, um, to give them really high visibility across all our different touch points. So very exciting times. And the podcast I, I host is called Digital Transformation and Leadership, um, growing uh, listener base. It's been running for a year now. We just entered season two. Um, I've got some great guests lined up over the next couple of months. So I'd love that if you, if you check that out on all the normal streaming services, Apple, Spotify, Google, Digital Transformation and Leadership. Brilliant. And we'll, we'll, we'll pop a link in the in, in the yeah. show notes as well, because uh, I'm sure people will want to listen to you talk a little bit more because yeah, it's clear you think about this stuff hell of a lot, like I say, which is why I wanted you to come on. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So <laughs> just Danny Levy on LinkedIn. I, I normally share a, one of these deep thoughts, Fred, once a day. I have to get well, out of my system. <laughs> well, you've got a lot of them. I mean, I've, you've yeah. seen me scribbling stuff down here and I yeah. sort of like to get a little episode title and then sort of at least three points and mm. you've given me a hard job <laughs> you know I'm, 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 I'd, I'd be interested to see what you come up with <laughs> I, I don't even know yet no, there's, there's, yeah. there's, there's, some, there's some great ones on there speak yeah. to your customer how about that <laughs> people that lot of grab people's attention go what yeah. <laughs> what's the honor that you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. um no there's, there's there's some great things so uh well if someone's listening to it they'll know what we've called it um yes thank you so much for your time i, I really do appreciate it Thank you for having me on your show, Fred. It's tea time for you, I think, now, isn't it? Yes, my daughter's just come back from school, so the doors are banging, so we're just finishing at the right time. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and it's time, time, for, time for a cup of coffee for me. So, yeah, yeah. You've done well. Very, very early for you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Danny. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Good to talk to you.